Welcome to another History Lunch and Learn. Uh, so you must be fans of murder mysteries here, huh? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going back to the 1860s for this one. So I hope you enjoy. Uh, our main characters today are William Bell, Ruth Boot, who later becomes Ruth Bryden, Almeda Boot, William Morley, Robert Bryden, and Sarah and John Bryden. And the story takes place in Ela Township and also right here in Washington. So be listening, listening closely uh, to the characters involved and we'll, uh, at the end, I'll let you be the jury to see, uh, see if they got it right. So 21 minutes. That was the amount of time that the body of William Bell was allowed to hang before Waukegan Dr. Moses Evans pronounced life extinct. This brought a climax to the first public execution in Lake County. For 21 minutes, an audience witnessed the final moments of a condemned man. William Bell had been accused and tried for murder. He was found guilty by a jury and sentenced to death. There is much more to the story. In fact, it is a story that one might see in a crime drama on television today. The year was 1863. The country was two years into the Civil War. Many of the best men in the county had volunteered to serve for the Union cause. Death was a way of life, especially with the war, but murder was not unheard of. That was until the events of December 22, 1863. Ruth was an immigrant from England who was born around 1804. Ruth married William Boot in March of 1830 in England. Their first child, a daughter named Sarah, was born that same year. In 1841, Ruth and William Boot decided to sail to America. The Brighton family departed Liverpool on a ship named the Stephen Whitney. It is unknown as to why they chose to come to Lake County, Illinois. The U.S. government had just started selling farmland in Lake County in 1840, so the most likely reason was just that, available land rich for farming. Upon arrival, William Boot traveled out to Cedar Lake to look for what available land could be purchased. He found 40 acres in what is today's Cuba Township. In 1844, William purchased another 40 acres that was near his original property. William was able to keep purchasing adjoining land, and by 1852, he had acquired over 400 acres. As William was farming and acquiring land, the Boot family continued to grow. Shortly after arriving to Lake County, a boy named Alonzo was born. He died a few years later, though, in 1844. In March 1847, daughter Almeida was born. William and Ruth's first child, Sarah, married John Bryden in 1848. John and his father, Robert Bryden, had come from England, just like the Booth family, and their farm was very near to William and Ruth Booth. Now, William Booth died in May of 1853 at the age of 46. It is believed that he was ill, as he made out a will a few months before his passing. In the will, he left all of his 409 acres to his wife, Ruth. After William's passing, she gave 156 acres to her oldest daughter, Sarah, and her husband, John Bryden. Ruth then made her own will, in which the remaining 253 acres of land would go to her other daughter, Almeida. So this was not exactly a fair split between the two children. Ruth remarried quickly after the passing of William. She married Robert Bryden, her oldest daughter's husband's father. So the mother-in-law married the father-in-law. After the marriage, Ruth and Robert Bryden and Almeida Boot all lived together. In 1856, Robert Bryden made out a will of his own. He too have, may have been ill and realized that his end was near. In his will, he left everything to his wife, Ruth. 
he only left his son, his son John, $100. Now, $100 in 1856 is a good amount of money, uh, but still, all that land was not passed down to his son and to Ruth's oldest daughter, Sarah. This did lead to resentment between John and Ruth, and this would continue for quite a long time. Ruth Brighton, now a widow for the second time after the passing of her second husband, Robert, well, now she and her daughter, Almeida, were now alone, and they needed assistance on their farm out in Ela Township that they lived on. And in 1863, Ruth hired William Bell to work the farm and share the crops with her. Mr. William Bell was born in Massachusetts on February 26, 1828. William Bell was a married man with a young, with a young daughter when he left Massachusetts. He left both his wife and child for some reason, and he came to Illinois. Bell made his way to Illinois in the late 1850s or early 1860s and settled in Ela Township. Mrs. Brighton rented her farm on shares to William Bell, and he lived and worked at the Brighton farm. The relationship between Ruth Brighton and William Bell apparently soured over time. Ruth accused William of stealing from her. She also did not like that William sought to marry her daughter Almeida. William was 35 and Almeida was 15. Both Ruth and Almeida did not like the fact that William, an already married man, had asked for Almeida's hand in marriage. And it was later felt that William wanted to marry Almeida so that he would inherit Ruth's farmland. The relationship between Ruth and William grew worse and arguments ensued. It got to the point where Ruth would not allow Almeida to go to school, as she did not like being alone on the farm with William. Ruth Brighton woke on the morning of December 22, 1863. And she told her daughter Almeida that she desired for her to stay home that day and not attend school. Almeida told her mother that she wished to go to school, and Ruth finally consented. Almeida headed off to the schoolhouse. Shortly after arriving to the school, Almeida was told that her mother had been murdered. Between 7 and 8 o'clock in the morning, a daughter of Mr. William Morley, a neighbor who owned a farm next to Brighton's, heard a woman cry of murder. The daughter told her father that it was Mrs. Brighton who was hallooing. Mr. Mor Morley, thought that it was a prank by some local boys, but finally decided to go over to the Brighton farm and see if anything was the matter. Mr. Morley found that the house was locked and no one was inside. He next went to the cow yard, and that's where he found the lifeless body of Ruth Brighton. To Mr. Morley, it appeared that Mrs. Brighton had been out milking her cow and had milked about a quart before she met her death. Her body was lying on the right side her throat was cut. The side of her face and head bore marks of having received blows from some flat instrument. In her hand, she clutched to a shaving razor. A light snow had fallen that morning. Tracks were found, apparently those from Ruth Brighton, and the other from her killer. Neighbors followed the tracks to the nearby farm of Mr. Orson Cadwell. There, they found William Bell holding an axe and chopping wood. It was determined that Bell's tracks matched those found at the scene of the crime. Bell was told of the crime that had been committed against Ruth Brighton, and he responded, Is that so? The neighbors asked Bell to come with them back to the Brighton farm. He agreed and set his axe down. Bell was told to bring the axe with. Bell did not approach the body of Ruth Brighton when he returned. The razor that Ruth Brighton was clutching was removed from her hand and was shown to Bell. He was asked the direct question of if the razor was his or not. He responded, it looks like it, and he responded in a very calm voice. He professed to not know how the razor came to be in the clutches of Mrs. Brighton 
and he said that he had not used the razor in quite some time. William Bell at this point did have a beard. The razor and the tracks were enough circumstantial evidence to arrest William Bell. He was taken before Justice Bangs of Wakanda for examination. Bell waived the examination by the judge, and he was committed to the county jail here in Waukegan. The next step in the process for William Bell, after waiving the examination by Justice Bangs, was a trial by a grand jury. After waiting seven months in the county jail, Bell was found guilty by a grand jury. The next step now was a trial with the jury of his peers. William Bell would have to wait another 21 months for this trial to take place. The folks weren't in a big hurry to get this trial going at that point. Uh, the Civil War consumed a little more of their, their time at that point. At the start of the trial, William Bell was brought into the courtroom of the Lake County Courthouse and placed in the prisoner's box. Bell was about five feet, nine inches in height, slender in form. He stooped forward when he walked, had dark brown hair, mustache, and whiskers at this point. He had light blue eyes with a prominent nose and forehead. And he was also considered to be quite intelligent. It's interesting the facts that are provided in the old newspapers, right? <laughs> can't rely on television or anything like that. People know what the person looks like. They have to depict it all. So the jury was first presented with the facts. The coroner reported that the jury, to the jury that the deceased came to her death by a blow given by some blunt instrument and the cutting of the throat by some person to them unknown. It was explained that the razor was put in the hand of the deceased to make it appear that Ruth Griden had committed suicide. And it was also told that it was believed that the flat end of the axe was used uh, to hit Ruth Griden on the side of the head. Next came the defamation of character of William Bell. Ruth's daughter, Almeida Boot, was one of the first to take the stand at the trial. The first story that the jury heard was that two weeks prior to the crime, Ruth Griden had gone to visit her brother-in-law's farm. The detail was provided that she had locked her home when leaving. She had left $110 in a dress pocket in her bedroom, and when she returned, she found the money missing. Ruth Griden confronted Bell about the loss of money. He said he had not seen anyone around the house and had no knowledge of the matter. Almeida said that her mother suspected that Bell had taken the money. Almeida recounted the events from the morning of the crime. She said that she had breakfast with her mother and also William Bell that morning. They all had breakfast together. When Almeida left for school, she remembered seeing William Bell in the dooryard chopping wood with the axe. Almeida also recounted that William Bell wanted to marry her. Almeida said that she had told William Bell that she could not marry him, as he already had a wife. Upon hearing this, Bell's, Bell's past was starting to look at more closely. And it was found that he indeed did have a wife, Coleraine Donnell, who he had married in 1854 in Massachusetts. And they had one daughter, Almira, and she was seven when the trial was going on. So the jury was now hearing stories that Bell had left his wife and child, and that the 35-year-old was now trying to court the much younger Almeida Boot. It seems as though Almeida was interested in marrying Bell, but her mother refused. And that was the story that Almeida said. The jury now had a motive. Bell murdered poor Ruth Griden because she would not consent to allow him to marry her daughter. Bell had aspirations to marry Almeida and have control of the large farm in Gila Township. Almeida was in her mother's will to receive the farm if anything would happen to her. So the motive was Bell would finally gain wealth after the murder of Ruth Griden as long as he was married to his daughter. 
Now during all of this, Bell showed no emotion, and he continually claimed his innocence. It is said that William Bell's counsel ably defended him and repeatedly showed that the evidence was circumstantial. And the stories about Bell, aside from the wife and child, were all hearsay. When the defense made their closing statements, those in attendance, including reporters from the Chicago Tribune, were convinced that William Bell would go free. The prosecution made their closing arguments, which lasted two hours. Judge Turner followed in defense of William Bell in a speech of equal length. A Mr. Williams of the defense team then spoke for an additional six hours on behalf of William Bell. Long day. <laughs> He reviewed every point of evidence, showing that each was purely circumstantial. Of importance was that it was found absurd by the defense that Bell would kill Ruth Dryden with his own razor and then place it in Ruth's hand. The defense claimed that Bell had just been joking with Almeida about marrying him, and he really had no intent to do that. The defense also reiterated stories that Bell had shared, in particular, the hostile relationship between Ruth and John Brighton. Bell claimed that John Brighton was angered in the fact that he and his wife would not inherit Ruth's farm. Bell also claimed that there was a strained relationship with another neighbor, William Morley. Morley had been trying to acquire land from Ruth Brighton, but she would not sell to him. Remember, William Morley was the first to come upon the scene. After the closing statements of the defense, those in attendance were still convinced that William Bell was innocent and that he would go free. Mr. Reed, the state's attorney, then made the closing arguments for the prosecution in the case for Bell's guilt. After the prosecution remarks, those in attendance now believe Bell to be guilty of murder. Apparently, the audience was easily swayed, going back and forth. The four-day trial was now closed. It was up to the jury to decide William Bell's fate. The court opened on Saturday morning. William Bell was brought into the courtroom and sat beside his counsel. He reportedly sat there unmoved, as was usual for him during the trial. And as the verdict was handed to the clerk, still showed no emotion. The clerk opened the verdict and read as follows. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty in manner and form as charged in the indictment. A perfect silence prevailed throughout the courtroom. Everyone reportedly was very solemn during this moment, with the exception of William Bell. He remained unmoved and unconcerned. It was reported that William Bell had a slight smile on his face when he was escorted out of the courtroom by the sheriff. This truly surprised and unsettled many in the audience. On the day of the sentence, the courtroom was crowded with spectators. William Bell was placed in the prisoner's box. He was asked if he had anything to say as to why the sentence of death should not be pronounced on him according to the law. He rose and said substantially that he believed justice had not been done him that he never killed the old lady, but if the people thought he did, they had him in their power, or that he could stand before God and all of these people and say that he was innocent, that this verdict brought on by those villains out there, that when they cried murder every little while that would say anything, that life was dear to him as to any of them, but they could take it if they chose. Though it was hard to bear that God was his judge, and would judge for truth and not for lies. Judge Williams then, in a most feeling and impressive manner, addressed the audience and pronounced the final sentence of the law. Here is Judge Williams' address. This is one of the most solemn moments of my life, when in the discharge of my official duty, it becomes necessary for me to pass upon you that sentence of the law which shall consign you to a death of infamy. And I should be less than human if upon this occasion I did not feel for you the greatest commiseration. The hours of your life are numbered, 
and eternity with all its tremendous realities lies just before you. You are to die, not in a good old age, by the gradual decay of your natural powers, nor by disease, nor yet by casualty. You are to be cut short in the midst of your days and in the fullness of your physical strength. You are to die, not in our bed surrounded by sympathizing friends who strive to alleviate your sufferings, but upon a gallows by the hands of the public executioner, with no eye to pity and no hand to help you. With such a fate impending over you, how could I entertain for you any feeling but that of compassion? And yet I do not have a doubt of the justice of the sentence I am about to pronounce upon you. One year ago, this present month, you were indicted by a grand jury of this county for the murder of Mrs. Ruth Bryden. Upon your own application, supported by affidavits, your cause has been twice continued in order to enable you to obtain certain testimony which you profess is deemed essential to your defense. At the present term, your cause has been tried by a petite jury selected with great care so that they might be unprejudiced who for days have listened with strict attention to the testimony and to the arguments of counsel. You have been most faithfully defended by able and experienced attorneys, by two of whom your cause has been zealously advocated before the jury. I trust the court has done you no injustices as to the law governing the case, and the jury has been instructed to give you the benefit of the doubt, should any exist in their minds as to any question of fact. And yet, after careful and patient investigation, the jury has found you guilty of willful murder. And I am compelled to say that I regard the verdict as a righteous one. So the judge kind of leaves a uh, little doubt as to the fate of William Bell. It is execution. Now, during the delivery by the judge, William Bell is said to have retained that stupid indifference which has characterized him during the whole trial. He showed no emotion, and then he said that this was the stupidity of a hardened criminal. William Bell returned to his cell, apparently as indifferently as if he had no concern as to what had transpired. So this was February. Now we skip to Friday, June 30th, the day of the execution. So again, William Bell got to spend a lot of time in that county jail. So for the execution, it was decided that the hanging would take place inside of the Lake County Courthouse. Inside. The scaffold was constructed by passing a rope down through the ceiling of the, above the passageway of the courtroom. The weight was adjusted some five feet above the floor and secured above by a small line which passed down and was fastened to the ceiling of the south door leading to the cupola. This, when cut, allowed the weight to drop upon the floor above with great speed and force. A bag of sawdust was placed under the weight to break the fall and to prevent a loud noise. Reverend Morton of the Presbyterian Church and Reverend Campbell of the Baptist Church visited William Bell before the execution. They asked Bell if he desired for them to pray with him, and he agreed. Bell told the reverends that he was very nervous, and he was still declaring that he was innocent. At 2.30 in the afternoon, Deputy Sheriff C.G. Buell asked William Bell if he was ready. Bell replied, I am. He was taken from his cell and, with the assistance of Sheriff Orson Heath, was walked up the two flights of the stairs and took his seat in a chair, which was placed directly under the gallows and facing the courtroom in full view of the assembled audience. In the courtroom to bear witness were Reverend Morton, Reverend Campbell, Dr. Moses Evans, Dr. Bullock, the 12 jurors, as well as reporters from the Chicago Daily Papers, as well as from the Waukegan Gazette. The sheriff asked William Bell if he would like to make any final remarks. Bell said that he would like to say something, 
and speaking very slowly, he occupied nearly an hour. I'll read a little bit of what he said. Not the full hour's length, and not in a slow manner. I'm not worried about the gallows, so we can get through it, right? The prisoner's remarks. Gentlemen, I stand before you to address you for the last time. You are called upon to witness a scene you have never before witnessed in this county, and I hope and pray to God you may never witness again. You are called upon to see a man's soul and body separated. The scripture says, what God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Gentlemen, is there anything more systematically joined together than man's soul and body? You are called upon to see me hang by the neck until I am dead for the murder of Mrs. Ruth Greider. But gentlemen, I am not the murderer. It is a matter of great importance, a matter of serious consideration. I am to be hung, gentlemen, for what? For being a tenant of Mrs. Ruth Dryden, I am to be hung wholly upon circumstantial evidence. Gentlemen, the circumstances all point to me and nobody else, but what are these circumstances? In the summons, the daughter of Mrs. Dryden swears that I asked her if she would have me and said she was not so hard up as to marry an old married man. This proposition was made by me in sport, as a matter of fun, more than earnestness, and gentlemen, this is a circumstance against me. In the fall, we had some conversation about the measurement of six bushels of corn, and that is a circumstance against me. The morning the old lady was murdered, the girl and myself had some conversation regarding the fathering of cows. Not a word passed between myself and the old lady. That circumstance hints to me. Mr. Morley's daughter swears that she heard the old lady halloo murder, 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 for God's sakes help me. And she sat up and looked at the clock and put on her shoes. I think, she said, and went out of the doors and heard the lady halloo. Mr. Morley waited did his chores, and after, then he went to Mrs. Dragon's place and found the old lady dead. The circumstances hints to me and nobody else. Gentlemen, it is enough to astonish a half civilized, much more one that is civilized man to hang than me, on such circumstances still. I was tracked from the place to Mr. Cal Caldwell's, where I was at work. There was no tracks looked for any other way. The circumstance hints to me. I desire to say a few words with regard to connection to Mr. Morley and the dead and explain the facts. When I took up my residence with the old lady, both she and daughter forbade me from having anything to do with Morley or exchanging work with him. I never did. Consequently, a feud arose and the family threatened to burn Mrs. Dryden's house down, saying that they would wring her damn old neck. And Mrs. Dryden also told me that Morley's farm had said that she had kept a house of ill repute. Morley's family also reported that Mrs. Dryden's daughter was going to Waukegan to get a license for marriage between herself and myself. And Morley afterwards acknowledged that he had made it up and reported it still. Morley's son also corresponded with Mrs. Dryden's daughter. Gentlemen, there is no one who has stated these facts, though others know them, therefore I do it now. Gentlemen, I think that if Morley had gone to the house at the time his daughter swears she heard Mrs. Dryden cry murder, that he would not have found the old lady dead, for she was in the house when I left for Mrs. Cogwell's. That is the way he caused the circumstances to point to me. Gentlemen, I never killed Mrs. Dryden, and for that reason I must believe that it was done by him or by others to point to me. They tracked me to where I was chopping wood. Was there anything wrong in that? I was at work there, had been previously. Mr. Morley was one who came with them and he asked me going back where I kept my razor. I told him in the pantry where I always did. He said, your razor is gone. When I came within about three steps from where the old lady lay, I was asked, Bell, is this your razor? I answered that it looked like mine. I was honest when I said that. It did look like mine, but God knows, gentlemen, 
and I know that I have not had that razor in my hands for three or four months. I always treated the old lady kindly in every respect, and such a thought never entered my heart as to murder that poor old lady. Gentlemen, I am leaving this world as an innocent man charged with a murder that has been committed by some foul villain. I desire to return my heartfelt thanks to the Reverend Merton, pastor of the First Presbyterian Church, Reverend Cleveland, pastor of the Methodist Episcopal Church, and Reverend Father Donahue, pastor of the Roman Catholic Church, who have rendered me spiritual advice and comfort during these trying hours, and also to Sheriff Heath of Lake County and Deputy Sheriff Doug Buell, who have treated me with uniform kindness during my imprisonment. And I desire also not to forget to mention the very able efforts of the council who pleaded the cause in my behalf and did all that could be done by men to establish my innocence. May God forever bless them all. He kept going for a little bit longer, of course. You would want to uh, stall things too, right? Well, after Bell concluded his remarks, the officers came forward with the shroud and cap that was to be placed over his head. Bell made the remark, God bless this people, they know not what they do. After a short pause, while the rope was being adjusted, Bell said, Christ died for you, and he died for me on the cross. With the noose around his neck, the shroud and cap was placed over his head. Sheriff Heath shook his hand warmly, saying, Bell, this is hard, and I must do my duty. Goodbye. Have you anything to say? William Bell responded, God bless you all. The sheriff then asked Bell if he was ready, and William Bell's final words were, God's will be done. At precisely 3.40 p.m., the cord was severed, and the soul of William Bell was launched into eternity. He died almost without a struggle. Only a slight twitching of the arms was the only movement. The execution went off without any problems. The body was allowed to hang 21 minutes when Dr. Evans then pronounced life extinct. Bell was cut down and placed in a plain coffin and given to the charge of Mr. Marr, who is the sexton for Oakwood Cemetery. This was the end of the first case of capital punishment in Lake County. But did they get it right? Let's start with Ruth Dryden's daughter, Almeda Boot. Almeda was the key witness in the trial. She was the one providing the information on the relationship between her mother and William Bell. She was the one talking about the marriage proposal. Remember William Morley, the neighbor who was trying to get Ruth Dryden's land. Well, Almeda eventually marries Thomas Morley, who was the second oldest son of William Morley. Almeda took over the farm after her mother's death some of the property was sold away, while the rest was absorbed into William Morley's farm. So William Morley got what he wanted, eventually. And what about William Morley? He was the first on the scene to see Ruth Dryden. The claim was that there were only three sets of tracks at the scene when the officers arrived. One set belonged to Ruth, another to her daughter Almeida, and the third was attributed to Bell. Should there have not been four sets of tracks around the property since William Morley went to check out if anything was amiss? William Bell clearly addressed his thoughts of old man Morley in his final remarks before he was hanged. He thought it was him. <clears throat> and what of John and Sarah Bright? John was clearly upset that his father had passed all of his land on to Ruth at the time of his passing. Ruth's oldest daughter, Sarah, John's wife, must have also felt a sense of betrayal in that her younger sister, Almeida, was given more land than she and her husband by Ruth at the time, also as well. They ultimately did not get anything from Ruth Brighton's passing, but her murder could have been a simple act out of anger and revenge. Sarah and John quickly and quietly moved away right after Ruth Brighton's murder. To complicate matters, I will leave you with this. The Chicago Tribune had an article in 1888 
on the William Bell Haney. Now this is 23 years after that execution. The article was written by J.H. Connolly, who was going through the diary of John M. Wing. Wing was a reporter for the Tribune and was present for the trial and also for the hanging of William Bell. So from this diary, John Wing wrote, The first of two cases occurred in Waukegan, Illinois in 1865. A man named Bell was alleged to have killed Ruth Brighton, an old widow by whom he was employed as a farmhand. It could not be made to appear that he had anything to gain by the crime, but a web of circumstantial evidence was ingeniously woven about him that at least made it seem possible that he could have perpetrated it. And, in a community that had made up its alleged mind to hang somebody, that possibility was quite enough. If he could have done it, and there was no clear proof that he did not, why of course he did. There was another man who had been materially benefiting financially by Ruth Brighton's death, but he was a person of substance with social standing, while Bell was a poor, shiftless, homeless, friendless, ne'er-do-well, and fortunately for himself, that other man was able to turn against the lonely, unfriended wretch of the tide of popular suspicion, which went a long way towards conviction. Having studied the case very thoroughly, and made my mind up about it on the morning of Bell's execution. I said to the deputy sheriff, who was master of ceremonies on the occasion, it is none of my business, and even if I tried to make it so, with the characteristic of frankness, I gave my reasons for the faith that was in me, but said, go ahead. It is no funeral of mine. I don't belong in this community am in no ways responsible for the murder, am simply here to report it as a matter of duty, just as you, in discharge of your duty, will perpetrate it. But I simply wish to mention my recognition of the fact that it will be a murder. That's all. They brought poor Bell upstairs from his cell, and standing him right in the door of the courtroom where his life had been falsely sworn away put the fatal noose around his neck. There, nature gave him her last kiss, touched his heart with the agony of eternal farewell. Through the big, uncurtained windows, a flood of sunshine streamed across the floor, transforming its yellow sawdust to the golden sands upon eternity's shore on the farther side of the river of death. Upon the soft, Sweet summer breeze flowed to the songs of birds and laughter of children at play in the courtyard without. With haggard face and solid lips, the wretched man hoarsely uttered his last words in a passionate cry. The next moment, suspended high by the neck, he was singing to and fro, strangling to death. Six months afterward, that deputy sheriff met me in Chicago. He was a sturdy, big, great-hearted, kindly fellow but I was quite unprepared for to see him show so much emotion as he manifested when he took my hand. The tears stood in his eyes, and his lips quivered as he said, What you said to me about Bell's execution worried me. I couldn't get and stop thinking of it. I got to report to the trial and study them over and over, and I've spent over $1,100 of my own good money on detective work alone. I know now that you were right, and the man you thought murdered Ruth Dryden, though I cannot prove it on him, well, I believe we hanged an innocent man that day, God help us. Now the only man of substance in this story is William Morton first onto the scene, the one who had been quarreling with Ruth Dryden, trying to get her to sell land to him, who eventually has his son marry Ruth's daughter and gets the land. So, Jerry, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, the three footprints instead of four. Yeah. <laughs> Did he, what, 
what came of Morley, how did his life, do we know? Uh, I always think bad karma, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't recall ever seeing anything like that. It'd be interesting to know. Yeah, yeah. Now, William Bell, I mean, he was no saint. No. He left a wife and child to come to Illinois. He didn't dispute that he had tried to marry Alvita Boots. But then he said he was kidding. He said he was kidding. Yeah. <laughs> but did he come to Illinois to send money back to his wife and his child? Was he not able to find work where he was? I mean, you know. Or um, maybe the daughter plowed with more than his son. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Out of revenge and anger. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. That, but also there is uh, Ruth's oldest daughter, Sarah, that didn't get treated justly by her mother. And she left right after the murder. And she left right after the murder. Mm -hmm. yep. And Sarah married John Ryden, and John's father, Robert, marries Ruth. Uh, that's the second marriage. And, but then Robert doesn't give any of the land to his son. He well, he shouldn't have, but wasn't his to give one to the other family at the beginning. Well, no, it was Robert's own land that he had from oh. his farm. Oh. Oh. He gave that to, to Ruth. Oh. oh, so he didn't give that to John. He didn't yeah. give that to John. Okay. Which is very curious in itself, because women really weren't permitted to own anything back then. Yeah, I mean, it, it does start to change uh, during the Civil War. Definitely, women are are operating, working farms, uh, doing things like because that. Of because of the Civil War. Because of the Civil War. Now, I don't, I don't have everything in here. William Bell himself uh, actually volunteered to serve in the war uh, with the uh, Illinois 96th Regiment, where so many of uh, the Waukegan boys uh, served, but uh, he was denied, found ill, ill fit for duty. Physically or mentally? <laughs> they don't say. <laughs> Is his grave still able to be located in Oakwood? Oakwood? Um, it, it, he would just be in the Potter's Field, ah. so just in the in the uh, the mass the one grave the section. Yeah. yeah, we don't exactly know if he was there, but uh, we surmise that he is, since the, the Oakwood Cemetery sextant was given charge of his body. So. Most likely taken in Oakwood. Okay. And no one knows what came of his wife and his child? Uh, they, they were interviewed throughout the process, um, and it, they said that he had just left them. He wasn't sending anything back to them. He hadn't uh, sent any letters or reported back to him as well. He just got up and left. They didn't know where. wife didn't exactly come to Illinois during the, uh, the, trial. the trial, during the 28 months that he was sitting in the county jail waiting for all this to happen, too. I think the lack of footsteps is the most compelling yeah. piece of information. And how many straight razors were being manufactured back then? That straight razor may have been very, very common. In may the have been. Yeah. Could easily, somebody can go into the house, find the straight razor. And why William Bell, as a murderer, would use his own razor and then yeah. put it in the hands of, of Ruth Brighton <laughs> seemed a little strange. They thought perhaps maybe a suicide, so whoever did it was trying to stage it. Trying to stage it, right. Yeah, yeah but then they beat her head in. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so they thought it was going to be were they trying to make it look like the cow had kicked her in the oh. head? And then she slit her throat? She After she was down, startled her. I don't know. She, she got halfway through milking the cow and was like, you know, this is it. <laughs> Life is too <laughs> <laughs> overwhelming. <laughs> this is too much. <laughs> it's December 22nd. It's cold out here. It's starting to snow. I don't like William Bell, so I might as well just frame him. Yeah. <laughs> Did, um, are there any records? Learned anything from that? Um, not that I've come across, no. When was the next hanging? The next hanging is just a few years later. Uh, 
problems. So it's naturally everybody that, I think it's three, maybe it's two, I think it's three uh, public executions happen in Lake County each time uh, the person claims their innocence. Uh, Were they always indoors? No. Yeah, that's what was strange. Uh, too. Right. Because yeah. it was June. Yeah. Yeah, it, was it, wasn't, June. it wasn't in Clement weather. No. Was that in the courthouse in Waukegan, the second courthouse? This would be the first. first. Oh, the first. The very, first. Very, very, very. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so it's inside the courthouse. The jury that finds him guilty witnesses, witnesses it. Was that common to him that the jurors had? Well, of course, the first that. one they had not set a precedent. Yeah, they had. Later on, it, it did have a, a larger crowd for uh, the next, I mean, it was an outdoor one too. So. But I'm guessing unusual for it to have been indoors. That probably wasn't a common practice for I wouldn't think so. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I find it odd. Yeah. <laughs> They weren't convinced he was guilty either, so they didn't want to put it out for public display. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The ones who were really out there tend to just very straight laced. So I'm, I'm not saying I think, I don't know what he did. <laughs> you know, well, the circumstantial evidence, certainly, but the way he, he just sat not responding to anything yeah. is interesting too, with a little yeah. smirk or little smile smirk. or whatever yeah. when they. Yeah. Pronounced him guilty. The reporters definitely found that behavior to be strange. Yeah. Did they ever, uh, do you have any record of the jurors and what their circumstances were? No. no. I haven't come across the names actually. Of, of well, it's jurors. interesting that you said that they all thought that he would not be found guilty. Yeah. But in the end, did the judge override the jury? No, they, they, it, they just kept going back and forth. Oh, okay. uh, before the closing remarks, uh, the reporter's sense was that the people in the audience thought he would, he would be found innocent. Uh, then through the closing remarks, they basically, whoever was last to speak, they thought that person was right. So when the defense spoke, they thought, yep, he's innocent. The prosecution speaks, he's guilty. Then, uh, Did it say how long they deliberated? No, uh, the trial ends at some point on Friday. So they deliberate through through Friday, and then it's Saturday morning, they reconvene, and then they read the verdict. Then. I don't know if it's just a matter of hours or throughout the night. I'm not sure. I always find it suspicious, too, when people don't defend themselves. But we got to remember, too, this guy who sat in prison for almost two years before he was That's ever true. went to trial. He yeah. might have just finally resigned himself to the fact that this was <laughs> happening. And he, yeah. he must he probably had internal conversations about well who's gonna believe him? He's just this mm -hmm. you know wayward guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He may have convinced himself there was no reason, you know, be, be as calm as possible. Yeah. And under the circumstances. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or the lawyer told him. Maybe. Maybe. And, and a smirk could be, you know, um, a, what's that, self-whatever prophecy. Um, Self-fulfilling? Yeah, yeah, that he may have already resigned in his mind and he was going to be found guilty. And, mm -hmm. you know, there it is. Yeah, but you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I get that look a lot. <laughs> Who owns the farmland now? Um, Go through generations? Uh, Today it is where the farm was, and it, it's an entrance to a, a golf course. Yeah. I don't remember the name of. Bittersweet or one of those. Maybe. Yeah, I'm not very familiar with with that part of the county. What town area is it? Uh, Ela Township. So kind of around Wakanda. So with, with this research, uh, some of it is uh, research that we did uh, here, uh, but also the uh, Ela Township Historical Society, they've done a lot of research as well on this. Uh, and I think they're actually, they're telling their own version of, their, of the story later this month on the 20th. Well, Danny Wishbill was forensics medicine. Yeah. 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 
we have just genealogy and things like that. And even just this, it's a from a genealogical perspective, it's just strange. You start to see all these names and then you see Ruth Dryden here and Robert Dryden. <laughs> <laughs> so they're Family trees are getting all kind of weird there. Yeah. <laughs> That's much more common than people realize, though. My yeah. grand, my grandfather passed away. A great grandfather passed away, so my great grandmother married his brother, which is biblical. When yeah. the mm -hmm. brother dies, the other brother's supposed to step up. And right. well, right. people didn't travel that big of an no. area either. No, they were right. limited to who they saw. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. <laughs> no. No, just pictures of the first courthouse. Like, how often do you do these? Um, <laughs> do it once a month. Uh, the, the second Friday of the month that we're at right now. Yeah, that's all about right. Yeah, the next one's on November 9th. So, in uh, commemorating Veterans Day, the stories will be about some of our famous veterans. December 14th, we walk even in the Civil War. So we will have a, an exhibit on the stage at that point. That, an exhibit called Abraham Lincoln, a man of his time, a man for all time, uh, will be here on the stage. Uh, the Historical Society was gifted uh, this exhibit. It was a traveling exhibit by the Gilbert Lehrman Institute of History. Uh, so we, uh, we're the proud new owners of that, so we're going to showcase it here for a while and do some Lincoln stories along with that as we conclude the celebrations of the Illinois Bicentennial. We're going to close it out with Abraham Lincoln, of course. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Later on this month, uh, we have haunted walking tours. They're wonderful. Yeah, I went on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some of you have helped us share a few stories sure along the way. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. The uh, story from today, it does factor into uh, to the Haunted Walk, as uh, it's believed by a few that the courthouse became uh, haunted. haunted, yeah, or cursed mm -hmm. because of things like the wrong people being <laughs> found guilty and then executed on the grounds there. Mm -hmm. um, we do have uh, our first concert of Waukegan Symphony Orchestra coming up. It's on October 21st at 4 o'clock at the Trap Auditorium at the Brookside Campus. And the next day, we have a fundraiser called Eat with the Arts. So with this one, it's at Bonnie Brook from 4 to 7 o'clock at night. It's actually breakfast at dinner. Who doesn't like breakfast at dinner, right? Uh, we'll have musicians there that are supported by the fundraiser and it helps support the symphony orchestra, concert chorus, and then programs and scholarships that we do here. So, oh, cool. Tickets are $8, kids 7 and under are free. Aren't you doing a night walk or something at Oakwood? Did I read that somewhere? Um, yeah, I am. Yeah, we're for cool. the first time. Um, it's called the Sunset Cemetery Tour. Yeah, that'll be interesting. Yeah, we're doing that on Friday, October, or, sorry, Friday, November 2nd. Okay. It starts at 5.15, and uh, basically we are concluding the celebration of Day of the Dead. Sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah, with, yeah. with this uh, tour. So mm -hmm. we'll be going to the different grave sites uh, that, that tell the story of, of Waukegan's diversity and history. Yeah. You know, with the lack of parking, well, are you just going to park? We're, we're just going to park there. Yeah. Thank you all for joining. Thank you. This is Thank you. Thank you. Well, Karen was going to talk to her, but I'm going to bring my stuff back to the next mm -hmm. meeting. What do you think, Tony? You want to do put it on YouTube? Yes. Cool. Yeah, we've never done it before. Should be within a week. Okay.